Well, good evening, everyone, and I want to welcome you back to our nightly meeting on um, Book of Revelation Made Simple. Tonight, we have a very special message. I call it message to every person in Buckalone, and obviously for the rest of the world. Tonight, we are going to look at the Book of Revelation. In Book of Revelation, we have, can you guess how many chapters in the Book of Revelation? There are 22 chapters. And let me just give you a quick outline on these uh, chapters, all right? Now, 22 chapters, so don't get, don't get confused. Don't be afraid. Let's make this really simple. Now, the first three chapters are about, according to the Bible, we call it the seven churches. What did I say? Seven churches. And then chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7, these four chapters, we call it seven seals. What did I say? Seven seals. And then chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, these four chapters, we call them seven trumpets. What was that? Seven trumpets. So if you notice the beginning, the first 11 chapters, it's really easy, right in the middle, the first half, 22 chapters, first half, 11 chapters, yes, you can do mathematical calculation, you're Asians, yes, okay, so first 11 chapters, I just call it three major sevens, three major sevens, what are they, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets. And if you like the number, you can call it 777. Is that a lucky number at a casino? And I was told that this building used to be a casino. So today we're having spiritual lucky number. Amen? 777 from the book of Revelation. Now, that's the first 11 chapters. Now, let's look at the rest of the book of Revelation. Chapter 12 and 13 and 14, if you can read it. I call it, to make it really simple, the war between the church and the dragon. Those three chapters. The war between the church and the dragon. In fact, a few, uh, few nights... From today, I'm going to talk about uh, a very special message. I call it the beauty and the beast. Don't miss that one. It's a very important one. It's very interesting. And I, I, again, I call it the beauty and the beast. So, so 12, 13, and 14, the war between the church and the dragon. And then chapter 15, 16, 17, 18, we... I like to call it the judgment against Babylon. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we have these terminologies are really borrowed from the Old Testament. When the book of Revelation speaks about Babylon, this is not talking about the Babylon that existed a long time ago and it doesn't exist anymore. We are talking about spiritual Babylon. We are talking about the kingdom of darkness, the evil force that exists in the end time. And the Bible calls it Babylon. And then the Bible, in those chapters, it is revealed that God will bring forth judgment against Babylon in those four chapters. And then, chapter 19 and 20, the coming of Jesus. It speaks about how he, how he will come as the word of God and how he will take his people and reign with his people 1,000 years in heaven. And then he will come back to re establish to recreate and to to recreate the earth and heaven and finally before he recreates heaven and earth how he is going to destroy all the wicked it's an amazing awful scene but it's an amazing chapters right there chapter 19 and 20 and then 21 and 22 new heaven 
and new earth. It speaks about new Jerusalem. It speaks about new earth, new heaven. It speaks about how God and the Lamb of God and his people are going to dwell together in that beautiful place. How many of you, how many of you want to go to that beautiful place in heaven? Amen? That's the reason why we are all here. So, this is the book of Revelation. Now, there are so many details that I cannot, I don't have time to go into all the information. However, tonight, I want to share with you, I personally believe this got to be the most important part in the book of Revelation. As I mentioned to you before, many people, when they think of the book of Revelation, they only think of the dragon, maybe Babylon, 666, not 777. They only think of the destruction, the plagues, and the judgment. However, when you look at the whole book of Revelation, there are so many different messages. But tonight, let me show you the most important part in the book of Revelation. It's not about the dragon and the beast. In fact, the most important part of the book of Revelation is the first part, the seven churches. Why is that? Why is that the most important part? If you get a chance, please do read the book of Revelation. Read it once. You don't understand? Read it again. You don't understand? Read it again. Keep reading until you can understand it. I recommend to you, you should read it at least uh, seven times. Since we like the number seven, let's keep using that number. Read it seven times. Can you read Book of Revelation seven times before tomorrow? And nobody says amen. Can you read it at least once? Say yes. Okay, just read three chapters. In the, uh, 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 very simple, read five chapters for breakfast. Read another six chapters for lunch. And then read another 11 chapters for supper. Before you come to the meeting. Amen. All right. If you can, that would be great. Please read it. Have a look. Get yourself familiar with it. And you will notice when you read the book of Revelation, all right, there are so many prophecies and symbols and signs, events, prophetic events that the Bible describes. But please, let's just make the whole book really simple. The whole book is about, let's get ready for the coming of Jesus. Right? Yes, these awful events will take place. But my greatest question is, how can I be ready when Jesus comes? And when you look for places in the book of Revelation. Now, Throughout the book of Revelation, God put little nuggets, verses here and there, letting you know how to get ready for the coming of Christ. God has sprinkled the wisdom of how to get ready for the final days. All right? Throughout the book of Revelation. However... Do we have a place where instruction on the preparation part? Do we have anywhere in the book of Revelation that has a concentration on the instruction for how to get ready? If you look for that, it is in the seven churches. In fact, uh, in many cases, in many cases, when you study different books of the Bible, 66 books of the Bible, right? In many cases, the most important part is usually right in the beginning. So, then that is the reason why we want to study the seven churches. Because in those three chapters, in fact, chapter 2 and 3, those two chapters will tell us how to get ready. So let's look at it. In the book of Revelation, as I was mentioning to you, number seven is mentioned so many different places. For example, seven churches, seven stars, seven horns, seven candlesticks, seven lambs, seven spirits, seven eyes, 
seven seals, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven crowns, seven heads, seven angels, seven plagues, seven kingdoms, seven mountains. So many, right? Are you getting tired? We have one more, seven blessings. And then there are some, I'm sure there are some ones that I missed. But there are so many sevens. Do you ever wonder, why seven? Does God like lottery? Why seven? You see, it's very simple. It is very interesting that number seven, the very first time number seven was introduced in the book of Genesis chapter one. So the whole Bible began with the number seven. So according to the Bible, what does seven mean? Okay? Number seven, according to the Bible, it means this. How it was used in the book of Genesis. God said, let there be light. There was a, there was a day and night, night, evening, and the morning. And it was the first day. And the second day. And the third day. Look at, listen to the way God was counting. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. That way of counting is an indication of progression, development, something started, and something finished. So in the Bible, number seven, is, uh, number seven gives you the idea of something started and something will finish it. Exactly. So in the book of Revelation, we have so many sevens. Why? Because the Bible is trying to say, God is trying to reveal to you how he's going to begin and then how he's going to finish the work. So when the Bible speaks about seven churches, God is using these seven churches to give us a lesson of how to get ready for his coming and, and to be able to complete his mission. It is written in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. The Bible says, saying, I am what? Alpha and Omega, the beginner and the finisher, right? That's the idea. And the first and the last. And what thou seest, write it in a book. And send it unto the what? Seven churches which are in where? Asia. Now when you think of Asia, where is Asia today? Where, where is Asia today? It, it isn't Philippines part of Asia? No? Yes? Confused? I think it's part of Asia, right? Today we call Philippines, Japan, Korea, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, all these countries, Asia, right? But back in those days, Asia was not talking about today's Asia. Back in those days, that Asia, my friends, is today's Turkey. So when you see that word Asia in the Bible, don't get so happy so fast. It's not talking about us. Okay, but that doesn't matter because God loves every one of us. Amen? Now, so the Bible speaks about seven churches which are in Asia. And let me show you the picture. See, that's the modern day Turkey. Okay, that's the modern day Turkey right there. So let's name these churches. Say with me, number one, Ephesus. Number two, Smyrna, number three, Pergamos, number four, Thyatira, number five, Sardis, number six, Philadelphia, number seven, Laodicea. Now, these are the names of seven different cities. Long time ago, even today, these cities existed. Where? minor Asia or today's Turkey. In fact, if you like, you can take a trip to Turkey and have seven church tour. And they have guides and bus drivers and the tour guy will, they're, they're, they're ready to take you around. Just pay them some money. Okay? 
So you can do that today. So these are literal locations and cities that existed in the past, even today. And the question is, why is God using these seven churches? Why not? Because there were other churches, yes? What about Antioch? What about the church in Rome? What about church in Corinth? What about the church in the Philippi? What about Thessalonica? What, uh, what about all these different churches? Why only these churches are mentioned? The answer? I don't know. When you're studying the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you have to come to the conclusion, I don't know. Okay? So therefore, you have to gather what you can know. Yes? One thing that we can know, because God is using seven churches, He is giving us the idea of how He wants to start the church and how He wants to finish the church. And at the same time, He is giving us a historical description of His church from the first century all the way to the last days of earth. So, it is, it is based upon the Bible, we believe, my friends, that we are living in the time of Laodicean church. So we are all part of Laodicean. I just pray that you don't have the characteristic or the condition of Laodiceans, which is being lukewarm. And we're going to talk a little more about that a little later. So, so if you go to um, Turkey today, yeah, you can. What's interesting is this: you can take a trip from Ephesus, and then just going one one-way direction, so to speak, you can go through all the cities in one big loop. Starting from Ephesus, you go to Smyrna. From Smyrna, you go to the next place, Pergamos. From Pergamos, you go to Thyatira. From Thyatira, you go to. Sardis. Sardis, you go to? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, you go to? Laodicea. Isn't that interesting? Yeah? Even in the map, there are <laughs> these, church, these cities are uh, situated in such a way that you can make a one direction trip and you hit all the cities. All right, then. God, what are you trying to teach us from, from these seven churches? Listen. So this is what I did. On one screen, I put Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 all together. Okay? So these two chapters, can you see it? Can you read it? It's two, I know. I, didn't, I don't expect you to read this. But uh, it's really tiny and small. Okay? So just to let you know, there are a lot of information. Even, even for us, just to talk about seven churches, oh, we don't have time to go into all the details. Because look, there are so many uh, details and descriptions. So what I'm going to do is just get right down to the most important lesson from these seven churches. Are you with me? Okay. So then, uh, what is the most important lesson? Or may I say, what is God trying to say that we should do in order to get ready for His coming? Yes? So what is God trying to tell us? Well, what is interesting is this. You remember uh, uh, yesterday, last night, I talked about how, the, how God and the Bible, when, you, when the Bible is repeating certain topic over and over and over again that's how you determine that is very important yes yes repetition and that's what i did i look for a word that is being repeated throughout and then it has a, contextually speaking is very important within the message and this is what i found out in seven churches god constantly basically repeating this word Repent. It's right there. Repent. 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 How many times? How many times? Eight times God used the word repent eight times throughout seven churches. So what is God trying to say? Basically, I am coming soon. Before I come, I need you to repent. repent. Exactly. So then, 
And when God says repent, he is saying repent of sin. Yes? So it's, look, you know my background just a little bit. I'm a, I used to be a break dancer, street dancer, DJ, right? And graffiti artist. I was part of like a gang. So my mind is really simple, okay? I like to keep things really simple. So let's keep it really simple. The Bible is saying, look, you want to get ready for the coming of Christ? Okay, repent. Repent of what? Repent of the sins that are mentioned in seven churches. Is that clear? So we're going to discover what sins we need to repent. And if you repent of those sins, that can help you to get ready for his coming. Is that clear? Because when you look at seven churches, um, the Bible used the word candlestick to represent a church. And here we have seven churches. But then what's interesting is this. When you read each messages, they all have something similar. They all have introduction. They all have God saying something good about them, praise. And then God calls them to repent in certain churches. And then God gives a warning. And then God finishes with promises promises so they all have similar format okay to every church but pay attention to when God says what call to repent that's where we need to pay attention to so that's what we're going to do all right so then here we go what sins we need to repent of what sin what sin do you think God is going to re um, re let us know what sins what sins do you think is so awful what sins maybe you can list of many different sins but let me tell you something god could have given us a long list of sins that we need to repent of however within seven churches he only choose five sins to repent of five sins and the bible is trying to say these five sins are actually deadly dangerous what are they let's find out the first sin it says nevertheless i have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy what? First love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. And repent. And do the first works. For else I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Except thou what? Repent. So what is the first sin that the Bible mentions? That you have what? left your first love now what is that first love talking about that first love my friends it is speaking of the first love experience that you have with Jesus as your personal personal savior I remember when I became a Christian uh, when I was 17 years old I was going through a transforming experience because the teachings of the Bible. I remember those days, my friends. I was really simple. I was really just looking to God as my father. You see, my father passed away when I was 10. I, don't, I, I, I didn't have a good relationship with my mom. So when I came to know God, God became my father, my mother. So my trust in him, it, it was my practice, always asking God, God, please be with me. Show me, guide me, help me. Many times I don't pray long. I don't even know how to pray long. My prayers were really simple. God, just be with me, help me. It was that sweet, simple trust in God. And, and the moment, there were times, my friends, there were times, uh, Friday night, I'm at a college, but um, 
but the, for some reason, there was no worship services that I was attracted to. So here I am just worshiping in my own dormitory room, just by myself, just singing songs, opening the Bible, reading the Bible. And that moment, I felt this sweet presence. And my love for him was strong and warm and hot. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, do you know what I'm talking about? When you were persecuted, when you were challenged. I remember those days. My two sisters, they, because I became a particular Christian, they think I'm crazy, I'm stupid, I'm dumb. And they used to, uh, with their words, uh, persecute me. You know, they say, you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about. And they would talk to me from 9 p.m. all the way to 12 a.m., 1 a.m., persecuting me. I remember those days, my friends. I cannot say anything, but I was able to say, the Bible says, the Bible says this, the Bible says that. And then I was just enduring their persecution with meekness and humility. I remember having the presence of God right next to me. That's, that's my first love. Do you understand? Do you have that? And then I, I don't fight back. I don't get angry. I'm just looking to God and just depending on Him. And after four hours of persecuting me, my sister said, But you know what, Peter? I have to say, you're right. You're, you're good. And when I heard that at the end of four hours, I'm like, oh, praise God. Amen? And then the next day, I was nearby the beach. I went out to the beach, talking to God, thanking God for giving me that endurance. Do you have those experiences? I'm sure you have. You remember the time that you heard, you heard the message, Daniel and Revelation? Maybe the book of John, maybe the book of Romans. You heard the message you, and you had this joy, gratitude. You're enlightened. You're like dazzled. And you're like looking to God. Oh, God, save me. I'm a sinner. Yes? And you're really humble and all that. And meek. You remember those days, my friends? That's first love. And God wants us to continue in that love till Jesus come. But the Bible says, because you have left thy what? First love. Now, the word left is the same as lost. Left and lost. Same or not same? Not same. When you left something, you're leaving something, yes or no? When you leave something, you do it knowingly, yes? If you, if, if you lost something or if you lose something, you do it what? Not knowing. And the Bible says you have what? Left thy first love. Meaning, conscientiously speaking, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew that they were walking away from that first love of God. What is that talking about? Let me explain to you what happened. You see, this is Church Ephesus, okay? And Church Ephesus was the first apostolic church. And during that time, you know, we're talking about the disciples of Jesus and the followers of Jesus. They sat next to Jesus. They learned the teachings of Jesus. They learned to follow his image, his character. They also became very humble and meek. Yes? And then you can easily tell the Christians, they, they walk around really humble and meek. They don't curse. They don't yell. They don't get angry. They're just, you know, always loving and sweet. Yes? Yet, yet, at the same time, really strong. But then, these first Christians, they had a challenge. What challenge? All these different false apostles, false prophets, false teachers, they are coming into the church and challenging, challenging the followers of Christ. Meaning, they had... Theological Bible argument. How many of you had those kind of Bible and theological argument before? Have you had that? Yes? 
were you ever felt frustrated? Yeah? Uh, but anyhow, so, so, so they're being challenged by these false teachers. I'm guessing at first, with meekness, love, sweet kindness, dealing with them. But sometimes these false prophets and false teachers, that can really give you a hard time, right? You know how some people, they can just challenge you, and they challenge you with ugly character. Do you know anybody like that? Huh, you think you're a Christian? You think you know the Bible? Show me. You think you're perfect? You think you, you are, you're holy? Huh, I don't think you're holy. It kind of challenges you that way. Where is in the Bible, right? They may talk to you that way and kind of, kind of provoke you, right? Now, for some reason, the first Christians, they were enduring, but then they came, they, they came to a point, they come to a point of time, they cannot handle anymore. So this is what they did. They conscientiously decided not to be so meek and sweet Christians. They put that aside. Why? In order to argue with them and to win the argument. Let me ask you something. Have you done that before? Have you done that? You are defending the truth, but you defend the truth without the sweet spirit of Jesus. Nobody is, I only see few heads going, yes. Many of you just look at me frozen. Maybe you need to, maybe you have to have some little challenge in your life. But let me tell you something. When we are provoked righteously, that's actually a more dangerous time for us to fall. Why? Because in our mind, we are defending the truth, but we decided to use the character of Satan. That's the reason why sometimes people with the Bible, they can argue. Blood pressure is going up, voice is raising, they're sweating, yeah? And then they're just getting a little closer to each other, eyes getting a little bigger, veins are popping. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, and you're pounding on the Bible, yeah? <laughs> That's not the way that Jesus is asking us to present him, him and not at all. But that's what happened. <laughs> Listen, that was listed as the first sin. Let me tell you something. I know there are so many sins that Christians can commit, but let me tell you something. All of them have one thing in common, the fundamental, the root problem. And the root problem is they left the first love of Christ. They're no longer sweet. They're Christians, but mean, rigid, militant, forceful, and unreasonable. Not using common sense, just using argument. I say so. Uh, I am the leader. I know my Bible. I am the pastor. I am the elder. You just listen to me because I tell you. They don't have the sweet spirit of Jesus that says, well, let's find out what the Bible says. Let's find out what, the, what, the, what God said. Let's find out what the Old Testament says. Let's find out what the New Testament says. They don't have that kind of characteristics. They just go, you just listen. I'm the pastor. Oh, my friend. <laughs> That's not what God is teaching us. God is saying we got to have his character, meekness, humility. At the same time, stand firm upon only what the Bible says. But these people, they left the first love, first problem, first problem. And then, so we call that left thy first love sin. Sin of leaving the first love. And then this sin... I'm going to tell you the next sin, the next one, but the first sin, if you don't repent, listen, if you don't turn around, it says, 
you got to remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. So when you repent, my friends, you got to think of, okay, how did, I, how did I get here? What made me to become like this? What made me so mean, so rigid, so militant, combative, violent? What made me this way? You got to search your heart to go back where you have fallen. If you don't do that, if you don't do that, then you are going to most likely commit the next sin. What sin is that? Let's find out. It is uh, under church uh, Pergamus. It says, But I have few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the what? Doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Thou also them that hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at these verses, maybe you're a little confused, like, whoa, what is this? What is doctrine of Balaam? What is doctrine of Nicolaitans? I never really studied about those things before. I understand. Don't worry about it right now. But if you do have time, please go back to the Bible and study them. But let me tell you what they are in very simple term. Doctrine of Balaam. Balaam in the Bible, false prophet. So doctrine of Balaam, simply saying, false doctrine. Are you with me? False doctrine teaching and uh, doctrine of Nicolaitans one thing is for sure the Bible says God hates doctrine of Nicolaitans so what's going on in uh, church Pergamos during this time the, their sin was basically they hold the people that teach false doctrine that's their problem they hold the people that teach false doctrine. So doctrinal compromise. What's going on here? Let me tell you. Listen to me very carefully. What I'm about to tell you is very important. These verses are not saying your problem is, the Bible is not saying your problem is that you believe in false doctrine. No, 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 no. The problem is, you hold them that teach false doctrine. What's the difference? You don't believe the false doctrine, but you hold them. Meaning, you have fellowship with them that teach false doctrine. You know what the truth is, so you don't accept the false teaching, but you have fellowship with these people. Now, I'm, when I say fellowship, I'm not talking about, can you have a little, uh, can you eat pancit with false teachers? Yes, you can. Can you uh, serve them a nice uh, Filipino food? Yes, you can, no problem. When I say fellowship, this is the terminology uh, that the Bible uses to denote the idea of you trying to unite with them. Is a doctrinal and social compromise. So this is what happened. At first, they left the first love. And they became how? Militant. Violent. Combative. Argumental. Right, argumentative, right? But then they realized that's not working. So they go to the other extreme. You see, my friends, in Christian life, if you don't count, if you don't, if you do not, uh, if you do not watch what you do, you can easily go from really fundamental, legalistic, uh, rigid, and, 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 and really conservative Christian extreme, okay, legalistic, and then you swing to, ah, let's all be happy and embrace each other, and you just become completely uh, cheap grace liberal Christians. And there are a lot of Christians, what, what the Bible is mentioning is this, that you can easily go from extreme right to extreme left, swinging back and forth, okay? And when you have this kind of Christian life, my friends, you are going to have psychological confusion. And when you have that psychological confusion, you do not know where to stand. 
Why? Because you're not looking to the Bible. You're just trying to figure everything out according to your opinion, your ideas, and what you think is the right way. You'll get, you'll get yourself all confused. So look at what's going on. So they, first they became so rigid, so like combative, but now they became, oh, you teach false doctrine? Uh, well, no problem. Let's we'll just uh, hang out with each other. And then that will lead them to even greater problem. And the next greater problem is this. Under Thyatira it says, Notwithstanding, I have few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman, what's her name? Jezebel, which calls herself prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to come in fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So what's the problem in this church? In this church, they have a problem. What's their problem? Woman problem. What woman problem? What's their name? Jezebel. Is there anyone here named Jezebel? Because I met some people, I met some girls uh, in South America, their names are Jezebel. I don't know what their mothers were thinking when they were trying to name their baby. Maybe the mother was just flipping through the Bible. Oh, Jezebel, Jezebel. I don't know what happened. But uh, according to the Bible, she is not a good woman. She is basically a harlot and she is a false prophet and she is a pagan worshiper. So the Bible uses her name not because she existed in the, in, during that time. No, it's an example uh, using Old Testament character to describe the modern day problem, you see. And what's the problem during that time? The woman Jezebel. In the Bible, woman represents in church, and this church or this woman represents apostasy. Before it was a doctrinal compromise, but now it's an apostasy. Now they actually support. See the, see the word suffer? Suffer is not only a, not, it's not the idea of holding someone. Suffer meaning you allow them. You, you, you give them power. You give them control. You give them authority over you. So this is what we're talking about apostasy. So ladies and gentlemen it goes like this. You leave first love that will lead you to doctrinal compromise. Doctrinal compromise will lead you to apostasy, apostasy a greater sin. And then the next sin that you might commit is this. This is under Sardis. And the Bible says, Thou hast a name that what? Livest and are dead. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. So God is saying repent of this condition. What condition? You have a name that you live, but you are what? Dead. What does that mean? Uh -huh. You are a Protestant, you got the name, but spiritually speaking, you're dead. You got, you're a Christian, you have the name Christian, but inside of you, in the mind, you are spiritually dead. What happened? Easy. Look at the trend. You leave the first love, that will lead you to doctrinal compromise, that will lead you to apostasy, and then you're in apostasy, you're about to what? Die and you are dead, but then you want to keep continue to have the name. Why you want the name? Why people like to have the name? Why do they like to be a member of church? Because they think as long as they have a name, they have a security assurance going to heaven. It doesn't matter who I am, it doesn't matter what condition I am in, it doesn't matter as long as I'm a member, I'm sure somehow I go to heaven because there are many other members. They all have name, but they're all dead, just like me. Have you had that kind of false security that you use to cheer yourself up? I'm not that bad. Looking around, oh, that woman there, that mister over there, that deacon over there, that elder there, they're worse than me. I'm sure I'm not that bad. Have you used that kind of excuse? Ladies and gentlemen, those words are really an expression of those people who are spiritually dead but still claim that they have a name to live. You see, interesting, in these uh, sins that the Bible is telling us, he's not talking about alcohol, not that alcohol is not a problem. He's not talking about some other type of sin, maybe smoking or drugs 
okay? I know they are, those things are a problem. All right, they are. But my friends, these sins, not so visible. Not so visible. Sins that are so visible, so vivid, you can see it. The way they dress, what they, what they drink, how they talk, what they smoke, what they think. So visible, there are elementary level sin. Elementary. These kind of sin, huh, you, can, you can look pretty good outside, but only God knows. You know. But other people, they may not know. And those invisible sins to others are more dangerous. That's the reason why more people are going to be disappointed. Because they're, they're going to find out that they are not saved. Why? Because they give God their heart with their lips. But their heart, their mind was never surrendered to God. They never submitted to the love that can transform their life. They claim the love of God, God so loved the world, but they, they continue to refuse to change who they are inside. They have a name to live, but they are dead. Now you see why the message to seven churches are the most important message in the book of Revelation. This is what is missing in many other churches. Our church, other churches, all Christians, time has come for us, my friends, to get real with God and real with ourselves. What are you saying? I call this sin a form of religion. They have a form of religion, but no power thereof. And then this problem will lead them to another problem. The worst problem. <laughs> you, you thought I was talking about some really bad problems, right? Yeah, but let me tell you something. Out of all sins, this is the worst. This, 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 this is the worst, all right? Why? Because, listen, listen. Because thou, what? Sayest, I am rich and increased with good and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Can you imagine? The Bible says, what is their condition? They're wretched and what? Miserable. In what way? Poor. Blind and? Let me ask you something. Have you seen a really, really poor person? Yes. Can you imagine you're poor? That's bad. But on top of that, you're poor and blind. That's even worse, yes? But on top of that, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. And you're walking around like this. Can you imagine? That's pretty bad. That's wretchedness. That's miserable, yes? And that's the language that God described these people. And who are these people? Laodiceans. Who are they? Us. We are living in a time when we can have the worst condition that is recorded in the Bible. And what is their problem? What is their problem? Being uh, poor? No. Being blind? No. I mean, it's a problem, but no. That's not the major problem. Uh, they're, um, they're naked? Yes, that's a problem, but that's not, a that's not the root of the problem. But their real problem? Is this no not that thou art? You know what that means? They do not know. They think they're rich when they are not. So right now, how many of you you feel like you are a good Christian? Don't raise your hands. Do you feel as though I'm good enough because, because I do mission work, because I go to Christian school, 
I'm good enough because I've been a church member for 20 years. I'm good enough because I gave donations. I'm good enough because I'm in the church choir. I'm good enough because I lead out in Sabbath school or maybe Sunday school. Do you ever felt that way before? But the Bible says, as many as I love, I rebuke, chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. So these are the five sins. The, the worst one, spiritual blindness. So it goes like this. Left first love, or leaving first love, will lead you to downward path. Doctrinal compromise. And then doctrinal compromise will lead you to apostasy. Apostasy will lead you to form of religion. You have a name to live, but you're spiritually dead. And then if you continue to stay that way and not repent, not change your ways, then you become spiritually blind. Spiritual blindness. You think you're bound to heaven when you are bound to hell. And Jesus saying, repent. And Jesus gave us one counsel. This counsel was given to the last church. But in fact, the counsel that Jesus gave to the last church really is the solution for all the problems. His final counsel that he has given to the Laodicean church, it is a solution for all the problems. So therefore, if you want to, listen, if you want to, Get yourself spiritual healing. You need to take heed. Listen to this counsel that Jesus is giving to you. Jesus said, I counsel thee to what? Buy of me what? Go try in the fire. Jesus says what? Buy. Very interesting. Jesus saying, buy from me. So Jesus is selling. Is he selling salvation? No. But do you have to buy? Yes. Can we earn salvation? No. Can we work our way to heaven? No. But do you still have to buy? Yes. The, and, and the Old Testament, the Bible says, buy without money. Yes, without money, you buy, but you still have to what? Buy. So then, what is the understanding of buying? When you buy something, what are you doing? What are you doing? Come on. When you buy something, you, you exchange. Yes or no? Exactly. Therefore, in order for you to buy, you have to give something. Give what? In the Bible, there's a parable. A guy who wants to buy the land, the field, in order to get that hidden treasure. In order for him to buy, what did he have to do? Sell all that he had and buy that field. Exactly. So the Bible is teaching, yes, you cannot earn salvation. Listen, you cannot earn your salvation. However, in order for you to experience salvation, you have to give up all. Surrender everything from your heart. So, number one, that is required. Again, do you want to be ready for the coming of Christ? The first preparation, surrender everything. And you might say, I don't have the desire to surrender everything. Listen, just look to Jesus. Look to Jesus when he is on the cross. What is he doing? On the cross. Jesus is really surrendering everything for us. I know you and I, we do not have the natural desire to surrender everything. So don't just, please, don't make, do, do not make this mistake. Okay, I'm going to give up everything. I'm going to surrender everything to, from today and onward. I'm going to be good. I'm going to really do my best. Don't do that. That's a mistake and that, that is a trap. You're going to get yourselves disappointed again confused and then discouraged and then maybe give up don't do that what you need to do is this jesus i cannot surrender everything 
But I look to you who surrender everything for me. As I keep watching you surrendering everything for me, by beholding, we become changed into the same image. So look to Jesus who gave all so that you can give all. Say amen. amen. Do you understand? And then you are able to buy. That's what it means when Jesus said, buy of me gold. And what is gold? Why is Jesus selling gold? He's a gold seller. Why is he selling gold? Let's find that from the Bible. But what kind of gold? Gold tried in the fire. So in the Bible, gold represents, look here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, that the trial of your faith, faith, being much more precious than of gold that perished, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, take notice. Gold is compared to faith. So when Jesus said, buy of me gold, he is simply saying, buy of me what? Faith. You have to buy faith. What kind of faith? Faith that is what? Tried in the fire. Okay? If you buy gold, please buy pure gold. If you buy faith, please buy pure faith. And what kind of faith is pure faith? Faith that went through trials and hard times. If your faith, if you don't have a hard time right now, your faith is a, maybe a cheap faith. It's impure faith. Maybe. Okay? So what Jesus is saying, look, surrender everything that you got so that you may experience what it's like to have, what it's like to live by faith, even though you are going through a hard time. So really, my friends, you know, the, the, the problem with many Christians is this. When things go really bad, they're like, oh, God, save us, deliver us. Where are you? Jesus, please hear me. Oh, we are fasting. We're praying. Right? We're giving up things. But then when things are going well, we're driving, nice car, big house. We have a one refrigerator and two refrigerator. Yeah, we have all the rice for, you know, next 1,000 years. And we're like, we have like, we, our bank account is loaded, is fat as a pig, and we're all comfortable. And you're like, oh, Jesus loves me, this I know. But the Bible oh, tells me so. That's how you pray. Yeah? That's why that you can easily become little sin, lukewarm. That's why Jesus said, buy, surrender everything, get into it. Get into what? Living by faith. What kind of faith? Faith that will go through fire. And then Jesus said, buy white raiment. What is right? white raiment in the Bible? Let's find out. Revelation 19 verse 8, the Bible says, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the what? righteousness of the saints so um, white raiment represents righteousness and obviously we're talking about righteousness of Christ because we don't have our own righteousness so Jesus is saying buy of me gold buy of me white raiment so what is Jesus saying gold faith white raiment righteousness Let's put it together, ladies and gentlemen. Let's really make it simple. Can we go to heaven with our own righteousness? No, you cannot. Your righteousness, it stinks. Our righteousness stinks. It's really bad. No way. It doesn't matter how holy life you live. It doesn't matter how obedient you are even today and onward. Your righteousness cannot qualify yourself to enter in the kingdom of God. Only the righteousness of Jesus can give you the the qualification and the title but listen now so then you got to receive his what righteousness you know in order to go to heaven but the only way to receive the righteousness you have to live by faith but in order to live by faith you have to surrender everything that's how it works that's how it works so some people say I live by faith but not surrender everything you know why? Jesus says, 
Jesus said, the only exchange that I will do, I give you everything, you give me everything. Is that right or wrong? That's right. What do you want? I mean, you guys like those uh, cheap Asians, always want bargain? Yeah? You just want, always want that good price? You pay little and get more? Yeah? No, you cannot become like that when you're dealing with salvation, with gospel. Jesus saying, I give you everything, you give everything to me. And the only way that you will give everything to God is for you, listen, the only way you give him everything is because you are experiencing his love. That's why first love is important. First love is the only thing will lead you to surrender everything. That's why love is important in marriage. Yes or no? That's how, that's how a marriage can work. When they say, I, have, have you seen the, you know, a bride and a groom? They look at each other on the wedding day, right? Their eyes are sparkling. They're, so, they're kind of smiling, happy, glowing. And the minister, minister, minister asks them to, to uh, cl uh, declare their commitment. And they say, I do, I do. Don't you know when they say, I do? And they better know, okay? A lot of these, today, a lot of young people, they don't know what they're getting, getting themselves into. But they got to realize when they say, I do, they're saying, I surrender everything. Why? Because I love you so much. I'm willing to give up because I love you. You see, only true love can give you sacrifice with joy. If you don't have that love of God, changing you every time you have to give up you're like Ugh, i gotta give this up too uh, i cannot eat that uh, i have to give god the tithe uh, i gotta go to church uh, i gotta give donation oh i have to get up and pray oh it's a, so, it's, a, it's a burden to do all these church things but you don't express it that way you do it like all smiling but inside oh so much, too burdensome, so heavy. You don't have first love, my friends. Can't you see? It's simple, yes? Yes? It is a love that will lead you to surrender. Surrender will lead you to faith. Faith it will lead you to embrace righteousness of Christ. And that's how you enter into heaven. And when you experience righteousness by faith, then, anoint thine eyes with eyes else thou may see. When you experience righteousness by faith, when you experience love that leads you to live by faith, and faith that embraces righteousness and have transforming life, when you live this kind of life, your eyes shall be open. You will begin to see the reality of the world, the great controversy. You begin to see Truth versus falsehood, good and evil, light and darkness, you'll be able to tell. But if you don't have the experience of righteousness by faith, true righteousness by faith, true surrender, you're just like a traditional church member. You go to church, but you have no idea the meaning behind. You give money, but you have no idea where it's going and, and what, what purpose. Not really, just you, you do something religiously, but you have no idea what you're doing. Do not live meaningless religious life. Know what you're doing. Because my friends, in relationship, you got to know what you're doing. Yes or no? How can a relationship last if everybody in the family member, they're so like a robot? Let's have breakfast. It's time for us to hug. Say goodbye. How can we have a relationship like that? But we do with God. It's time to go to church. Time to pray. Time to sit down. Time to stand up. Time to sing. Time to give money. Time to go home. And that's party. Then you become alive. Oh, church is done. Okay, now we can do whatever we want. Because when we go to church next week, we can just confess. So we treat God like a recycled sin trash can. And God says, 
you are not experiencing the power of God. Let me show you what I can do. Look what God is trying to say in the book of Revelation. You need righteousness by faith experience. And when you do, my friends, when you do, you're going to have this. Because the Bible says, it says, Be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Okay? So what is righteousness by faith experience? The Bible says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just put it in a really simple term. What is righteousness by faith? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I may know him. To know him is to love him. That's what the Bible says. To know him, to love him. Power of resurrection, power that God used to raise the dead. To give Jesus the newness of life, God can use the same power of resurrection to give you newness of character, new personality, new uh, personal being, the, the, the shine that you can have through his glory and his light. The power of his resurrection can transform your life. That's righteousness by faith ladies and gentlemen some people will go oh i remember the day that i was born again it was 1962 november 17 and 7 p.m well thank god you have a very good memory <laughs> oh, but listen just because you remember the date it doesn't mean that is assurance for your salvation because the bible says paul said i die daily we need to have that daily experience Daily, every day, we have to experience knowing Jesus Christ. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you experience that righteousness by faith experience, then you have access, access to all the promises. All the promises. Every one of them. And what are the promises? Let's find out. Promise number one. You guys ready? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. Whenever you read when the Bible says, to him that overcometh, it's simply saying, to him that repented, or to him that follow God. Okay? To him that overcometh. Overcome their problem. Through the help of God. Or you can read it this way. To him that overcometh, same as, to him that experience righteousness by faith. Same thing. So to him that experienced righteousness by faith, will I give to eat of the what? Tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Can you imagine eating the tree of life? I know you guys like to eat papaya, mango, durian, jackfruit. I know they're really nice fruits, okay? Uh, I like them too. Not all of them, some of them. Um, but can you imagine eating the tree of life? How many of you spend thousands of pesos on skin care? Nobody's raising their hands. Well, I mean, what do you use? We use natural way. You put the papaya skin on your face. I mean, what are you guys using here? You're spending some money, yes? Yeah, the living, uh, living young for a long time. That's an that's a in thing right now, right? Listen, when God gives you the tree of life, just one bite, all your wrinkles are gone so to speak you're going to live forever can you imagine living forever yeah i mean our life should be forever as long as you know you're going to die you cannot be happy as long as you know that you're going to die you cannot be happy i i remember the day uh, the night that i was going uh, going to a club and we got into a car accident and uh, when i got out of the car my friend's car became half the size and, uh, and, and I got really scared and then on the way to the hospital I saw another accident and it looks like someone actually died and at that time, I was 17, at that moment I say to myself, I could have been dead tonight and I like, oh yeah, that's right, I'm going to die 
The thought of, I'm going to die someday, will destroy all the joys that you can have in this world. Yes or no? We were created to have eternity, immortality. And God says, if you experience righteousness by faith, I will give you life. And again, the second promise. He that say, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, for some of you, this term might be a new term, second death. But second death just simply means, just simply means you are not going to die forever. Just simply, uh, there's another way of saying you are going to live forever, not die forever. All right? So it's another promise of life. And then the third promise, it says, uh, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a what? White stone, in the stone a what? New name written, which, is no, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Now you're, like, you're, you're probably thinking, what? That's the promise? That's what we're going to get? I mean, after we surrender everything and live by faith and experience righteousness by faith, and at the end, all we're going to get is new name? Yeah? How many of you feel like you want some more than that? I don't know what you're thinking. But the Bible says he will give us a new name. What does that mean? Identity. Yes or no? Identity. Let's move on. And then the next promise, the Bible says, And he that overcometh will and keep my works unto the end. To him will I give what? Power over the nations. I will give you power. That power, ladies and gentlemen, it is connected to purpose. Power is what? Authority. Authority means responsibility. If you have responsibility, that means you have a purpose. So God is saying, if you overcome, I will give you purpose in your life. And that purpose is to have power over the nations. Okay. And then the next promise. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Another promise. Okay. If you have righteousness by faith experience, I make sure your name will not be blotted out. It will remain in the book of life so that you can have life. And then another promise. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the new name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name again. Okay. First, he's going to give us us new name. And then he's going to give us new name of, the, of God and the city of God and the name of Jesus. Wow, we're getting lots of names. What is this? Identity. What is this talking about? What is this talking about? The last promise. It says, To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. The best promise of all. Why? Because, my friends, this promise says, If you overcome, if you experience righteousness by faith, you will sit with Jesus in his throne. Meaning, you will reign with him. Meaning, you shall share the power with him. And what is this talking about? Purpose. So, let's summarize. The first promise to eat of the tree of life is about life. Not second death. Again, it's about life. New name, identity or name. Power of the nations, power or purpose. Not blot out the book of life, life. I will write upon him my new name, name or identity. Sit with me in my throne, power or purpose. Okay then, let's summarize. All the all seven promises, you can you can make them shorter because some of them are repeating, yes? So basically what God is saying, he will give you what? Life, identity and purpose. When when you experience righteousness by faith. Ladies and gentlemen, listen very carefully. Special message to every person in Bacolod and rest of the world. Listen to me. 
Everybody in this world, not only you, the rest of the world, and including you, everybody in this world, in their life, they have a one, one thing that they so much, so much they desire to have. You know what they are? One, life. Two, identity. Three, purpose of life. Yes or no? It doesn't matter if they're Christian or not Christian. It doesn't matter if they believe God or not believe God. It doesn't matter their other religion. If you are human, if you are a person, no one needs to tell you to have these desires. You are born with these desires. What desires? A strong desire to live. So what do we do? We just keep eating, hoping that this will give us long life. But then we keep eating in digestion, we get fat, and then and we get diseased, and we get old and die, right? Identity. Identity is very important. Why, my friends? If you are a thinking human being, identity is everything. Who are you? Have you ever wondered, who am I? Why do I exist? What is my identity? Why God created me? Have you ever wondered that before? L let me tell you something. A lot of young people today, they are completely lost and confused. They're always trying to discover their identity. How do you do it? Just like the way I did before. The way that I was, the way that I tried to define my identity was through dancing, DJ, graffiti artist. Yeah, so that's even today, young people are trying to do, trying, trying out this, trying out that, this fashion, that fashion, this hairstyle, that hairstyle, uh, this music, that music, this group of people and that group of people, they're always trying to find a place they feel like they belong. And because of this, many times we're completely lost. We get disappointed, we try, we don't know who we are, we just give up, and then we just settle down to just survive. So you get up in the morning, you eat, but you have no purpose of life. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're like, why am I just keep living? Why do I exist? So if you do not know who you are, you do not know your purpose, your mission. So what God is saying, listen, if you experience righteousness by faith, I will help you to have life and full of life. I will help you to redefine, restore your true identity. Your true identity and who you are as a child of God. And when you experience righteousness by faith, then you will know your true mission and purpose of life. But a lot of people, when they go to church, they don't have first love. They don't know what they believe. They may even have false teaching in their mind. They don't care. They're doing things that are apostate. They don't recognize it. I'm a Christian, former religion, but they're spiritually blind. Do you want to live that way? If you live that way, my friends, going to church, there is absolutely no purpose. It's just a wishful thought. Uh, if there's a heaven and if there is Jesus, maybe just going to church might secure me in heaven. Just that wishful thought. There is no real, living, active Christian power that transforms your heart, your mind, your life. But why do you want to live that way? And you feel powerless, aimless. Ladies and gentlemen, when you get up in the morning, you should get up in the morning with this thought. Thank God for life. Thank God for you showing me who I am. 
God, thank you so much for giving me a new day. Show me what is my purpose for today. When you have that in your, in your heart, in your mind, your life, I tell you, the world will change. Not because the world is changing, because you changed. And then you can help the world to be a better place. So how long will you continue to just become dead traditional church attender? Don't care about the truth. Don't care about the real experience. So tonight, as you heard the message from the Bible, my question to you is, what are you going to do with the truth that was presented to you? Are you going to accept it? Or are you going to reject it? It's your choice. God cannot force you. You have to make that choice. But God loves you so much. He wants you so bad. He wants you. He wants you to make that decision this evening. I want to make a special, special appeal tonight. And this appeal is not for everyone. I'm speaking to those who are spiritually dead. You have a form of religion, but no power. You're a traditional Christian, and you're not really serious. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you because, my friends, I know what it's like to be in that kind of condition. So let me give you an opportunity. With your decision, have a new beginning. Amen? So if I'm talking to you tonight, and if you are that person, I'm not expecting all to stand up because I know there are some sincere, dedicated, devoted Christians here tonight. But if you're one of those spiritually dead Christian, but tonight you want to come alive with the love and the power of Jesus Christ, please stand wherever you are. God bless you. Blessings to you. It may not be for everyone. God bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For the rest of you who are sitting down, let me ask you to stand and rededicate your life tonight. And I want to have a special prayer with you. Because my friends, we may know all the prophetic events in the book of Revelation. But if we don't have that love, faith that works by love, and that love that leads us to experience righteousness by faith, we don't have anything. So let's make Christ and the Bible and God and heaven real. What do you say? Amen? Amen? Let's get into it. Let's study more. Let's get more knowledge. Let's get more wisdom. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for calling us, bringing us to the understanding of the deeper issues of life. Tonight we discover that it is so easy for all of us to become spiritually dead Christians at the same time thinking that we are okay when we are not. But then time to time you allow us to see who we are, exactly who we are. So we stand before you as sinners. We stand before you as hypocrites. We stand before you as wretched, miserable people. We stand before you as poor, blind, and naked. And we stand before you as a child of God who needs a great help from heaven. So we humbly ask you, O oh God, that we may experience righteousness by faith that can give us life, identity, and purpose in our life. 
help us to have Jesus and his truth real thank you thank you forgive our sins wash away our sins with your blood but tonight we look to you as our friend as our Savior this we pray in Jesus name Amen